Good morning, Trent's Hyde. My name is Henry Van Turf, and this is my wife, Barbara. This last year has been one like no other. We have witnessed many tragic events around the world. Protests and riots in Hong Kong, destructive wildfires in Australia and on the American West Coast, racial and political unrest in the U.S. leading to violent protests, the explosion in Beirut, the way our oceans and waste facilities are increasingly choked by plastic articles which we create, use and throw away, flooding in Sri Lanka, India and China, swarms of locusts in Africa, Pakistan and India, which have devastated the crops of subsistence farmers, and overarching everything, COVID-19, a war against an invisible enemy which has attacked the whole world, killing more than two million people so far, leaving old people to die alone and afraid, thrusting healthcare workers into a prolonged and exhausting battle, and throwing a blanket of fear over the earth. Our world is not new to disasters and catastrophes. Most of us remember the tragic events of September 11, 2001 in New York. Songwriter Matt Redman and his wife, Beth, wrote the song, Blessed Be Your Name, in response to this event that took the lives of so many American people. Matt said that among the hymn repertoire, there was just not enough language to grapple with grief. He stated, where were the musical poets and prophets to help the people of God find a voice in worship at this tragic time? The truth was, in most places we visited and led worship in, there was a distinct lack of songs appropriate for this time. When it came to expressions of pain and lament, we had very little vocabulary to give voice to our heart cries. Blessing the name of the Lord is easily done when life is going well, but it is much more difficult for many to bless God when experiencing intense grief or the loss of a loved one. The bridge in this song reinforces our need to place our hope and trust in God and to bless his name in all circumstances. It says, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name.
our heart will choose to say Blessed be your name in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. 
You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation.
Good morning, and thank you for once again joining us for our Trendside online services. We are always so glad to have folks from our local community, from our church family join us, as well as all of you who join us from different parts of the country of Canada, and even those from all parts of the globe. We are just so grateful to have you with us. Welcome. In just a moment, we will have another one of our Trendside elders, Wayne Lott, lead our prayer time. And then Pastor Matt is going to share with us our next message in this new series we just started last week, based on the book of Luke, which we are calling Choosing Jesus. But before Wayne prays with us, let me quickly share a number of important pieces of communication. First, our life groups begin this coming week, and they are also based on this current sermon series we are doing on the book of Luke. And we are already encouraged for the good response and the many people who have already re registered for these groups. Please know you are always still welcome to register. There is a group that would love to have you as part of it. And you can do this easily by just visiting our church website. Please note, at least for the time being, these groups will be meeting online. Let me also remind you of a few other important items. Wednesday, during the noon hour, we have our online prayer time. And again, everybody is welcome to this. It's from 12 to 12.30. And you can find the link to this prayer time in our weekly Trentside Connect email. Next, after every online service, our children's director, Darlene, sends out a special devotional and a number of activity sheets just for the kids. Parents, if you have not signed up for this weekly children's devotional, again, you can do so by just visiting trendsidechurch.ca. And likewise, each week, Pastor Ryan also sends out a devotional for the youth. And youth and parents, you can also sign up for this on our church website. Finally, before we go to prayer, there have been many asking about this controversial Bill C-6 legislation surrounding conversion therapy that is currently before Parliament. Earlier this week, we sent out a special Trendside Connect with a statement regarding this bill, along with a number of links to help you find additional information. We trust you will read our statement, make yourself aware of the details, and prayerfully consider how you may respond. Now, let me turn things over to Wayne Lott, who will lead us in our prayer time. Good morning. I have a uh, do a word of prayer with you this morning. And I just want to read you a little scripture that the Lord laid on my heart last night. And it's in Colossians uh, 4, 2 and 3. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open the doors of our measure so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ from which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim clearly as I should. It's just something that the Lord wants us to, to continue to reach out in his word and be his shepherds. So we'll just go for a time of prayer right now. Father God, I come before you with thanksgiving in my heart, Lord. I thank you for all that you've done for us already. Lord, I pray for all of our pastors, our staff, and our membership, Lord. That we, as we go through this time, Lord, that we depend on you. And as it draws us closer to our families, as we're locked in, Lord, that we spend that time with you, Father God. I just pray for Pastor as he brings his message, Lord, and that our eyes are open and our hearts are full. I just thank you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, Trendside. It's so good to be with you again online. Many of you, maybe like me, I grew up watching old westerns and war movies with my dad. And to this day, I still enjoy watching war movies, learning about battles that have taken place throughout history. There was a great German First World War fighter pilot who was known as the Red Baron. He flew a distinctive red three-winged aircraft, and he shot down more combat planes than anyone else on either side of the First World War. His kill tally was 80. On the 21st of April 19, he began chasing a Canadian plane that was trying to escape the battle near the River Somme. And as the Red Baron pursued his prey, he strayed behind Allied lines. He dived too low into the enemy lines, and he also missed another Canadian pilot coming up on his tail. We don't know whether it was shot, a shot from the ground or a shot from the pilot behind that killed the Baron. But what we do know is that the Red Baron 
came to his end because he made the mistake of pursuing that allied plane too long, too far. And no, it was not because of Snoopy. The Red Baron was good, probably overconfident. He broke his own rules. He compromised his rules and guidelines as a pilot, which led to his demise. For the Red Baron, the temptation of number 81 was obviously too much. Temptation for you and I always exists in life. We forget the truths and the lessons that we have been taught in life. We forget. We compromise. Sometimes we downright defy. There will always be temptations in our life that will try to lure us away from our first love, from choosing Jesus, our primary focus. We're into our second week of our series, Choosing Jesus, and we're working our way through the book of Luke. I trust you have started Pastor Jeff's challenge of reading through the book of Luke, a chapter a day before Easter. And last week, you will remember that Pastor Jeff shared with us about John the Baptist and his ministry of calling people to repentance, how John led the way and prepared the people for the coming teaching of Jesus, and how John baptized Jesus. This week, we carry on in the book of Luke. We're into Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Let me read that for you now. As Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. So the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I, will give, it, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. What I want us to walk away from our passage today knowing is this, that Jesus' victory over the devil shows him to be the righteous son of God and shows us, you and me, how to overcome temptation. Jesus was born into our world to live as a human being, to be hungry, tired, misunderstood, hurt, as you and I have all been. Jesus met every temptation as a man, and in his victory, he shows us the possibility that we can have victory too. There's a few lessons from this truth to keep in mind. And the first is this, we need to know our enemy. It is clear that Jesus understood the existence of, and the Bible teaches the reality of, the devil. The devil and the demons that follow him were cast out of heaven, and they are real. They were angelic beings who rebelled against God and now are behind much of the evil in this world. Growing up in the church, I certainly learned these facts, but it was not spoken of often. The idea that we are living in a world where there is a spiritual battle still happening is a reality. Now, since being in pastoral ministry, I have learned firsthand that this is a battle that it still wages in our world between the devil, his workers, and us. I don't want to speak too much about this and give the devil any extra attention than what is necessary, but we have to acknowledge this. The devil in our world has some power and ability, but, but he is nothing in comparison to our God. He is not omnipotent, he is not omniscient, and he is not omnipresent. We know from the end of the Bible that his final ruin is secure. But for now, he is an adversary we must deal with. And we should know that the devil picks opportune moments to get at us. After Jesus' baptism, Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit 
For 40 days, Jesus goes and fasts in the wilderness. And we read that Jesus was tempted in these 40 days. Three temptations are described to us and seem to occur at the culmination of his period when his hunger became intense. When Jesus is hungry, the devil acts with his temptation to turn the stone into bread. We don't know how the devil spoke or suggested these thoughts to Jesus. But he hit Jesus with these temptations at the moment when Jesus was hungry. He works like that. He hits us when we're down. He waits for a time when you or I are vulnerable. And then he moves in with his subtle suggestions to try and tempt us. The devil also seeks to deceive. In the second temptation, the devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he proceeds to offer all his dominion and its glory to Jesus, claiming that it, it has been handed over to me and I will give it to whomever I wish. All he asks is that Jesus bow in worship before him. The devil will offer at times a mixed bag of truth and lies to us. Now please remember, the devil's power in this world is limited and temporary. Jesus says to him that God alone is to be worshipped and served. We are to choose Jesus, to worship him and no one else. We always have to be on guard against his schemes. We must be on guard for false teachers, like I spoke about a few weeks ago, who use truth to get us and then sneak in lies. To use a fishing analogy, the devil baits his hook with truth, hoping that we'll take the bait and get caught on the hook. The devil as well offers up pleasure, not mentioning the pain to come. Like a clever salesman, he always shows the pleasures of sin, which are real but temporary. He doesn't mention the harsh consequences that will follow. Worship me and, and I'll give you dominion over all the kingdoms of the earth. Sounds good. But then Jesus will be the servant of the devil. And Jesus' mission that he came for as Savior would end. The devil still does this today in our lives. Give in. Enjoy the pleasures of the world. Sex, drugs, alcohol, money, and so on. All your friends are doing it. Why deprive yourself? He doesn't mention the risk of addiction, depression, disease that can come after these. Pregnancy, the spiritual or emotional consequences that come. Broken marriages, time in rehab, broken homes. He only dangles before you the good feelings, but he hides the ruined lives and homes. The devil's goal was to get Jesus to act selfishly, rather than to submit to the will of God, which included the cross. It would have been a tempting shortcut to gain the glory of ruling all the kingdoms of this world without the pain of the cross. Romans chapter 14, verse 23, teaches us that anything we do apart from faith and obedience to God is sin. This means we have to be careful not only to pursue godly goals, but also to use biblical means of attaining those goals. The next thing we learn this morning is that we must choose to submit to Jesus. Jesus lived as the perfect man, in perfect obedience to the Father, as he depended upon the Holy Spirit. The devil even acknowledged Jesus to be the Son of God. And the key that Luke wants us to see here is that Jesus, the true Son of God, was victorious over the devil's temptations. Jesus was physically empty, but he was strengthened by the Spirit. Luke's desire in his writing to us is for us to see the sufficiency, the superiority of Jesus, and that he is the Son of God, that he has triumphed where we as sinful men fail. Many people, in looking at this passage, ask the question, how could the Son of God even be tempted? Well, here we get into the mystery aspect of the person of Jesus. And the mystery is how Jesus was both fully God and fully man at the same time. Jesus did not have a sinful nature. For us, since the fall, we can be tempted to evil by our own sinful desires or by the devil. Now hear me here, please. Not everything has the devil behind it. Sometimes it is our own sinfulness at, that is at fault. The devil and his workers are behind things, but not always. They are not that powerful. God never tempts anyone to evil. James chapter 1, verse 13 teaches us that very clearly. But every temptation is also a test where God will allow it to take place to reveal what is in our hearts. 
we can sinfully put God to the test, demanding that he prove himself to us. And like the devil tried to get Jesus to do in the third temptation by throwing himself off the temple roof, but the temptation was also a test that proved Jesus' obedience as the Son of God, who would not put God to the test. Jesus' victory over the devil proved that he is qualified to be our Savior. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18 states, Since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. This really is the crux of what we need to understand, as I stated at the beginning today. Jesus did not meet the testings of the devil and his deity. Jesus met each test in his human nature as a true man. It is in this that you and I, we find hope. If Jesus has responded, had responded to the temptation in his divine nature, there would have been no help here for you and me. Jesus' victory would have proved nothing but that God is greater than the devil. But Jesus was born into our world. He did live as a human being and was hungry and tired, misunderstood or hurt as we all have been. And so Jesus met these temptations as a man. And in his victory, he showed us the possibility that we can have victory too in our temptations. The principles on which Jesus' victory was based are principles which you and I can live to, that we can apply in our lives. All this, if we choose Jesus, we must choose Jesus. Choose Him as Lord of our lives. We must bow before the Son of God and see our need to have Him leading our lives. Accept the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers and receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And then we need God's strength. We need the Lord to help us. We cannot battle temptation on our own. Jesus shows us how we can have God's strength to overcome temptation. He shows us the principles to apply in our life. First, we must spend time with God. Not only during these 40 days, but also at other times, Jesus would get away from the crowds, even from the disciples, to spend time alone with the Father. If Jesus needed these times, how much more do you and I need these times? If we expect God to draw near to us, to help us in battling our temptations, our sinful desires, then we need to get close to him. We need to do some work on our part. It's the same in any relationship. Time alone with God can be a special time of drawing near to him. Time alone with God does not prevent temptation, but it will strengthen you to overcome it. If you are consistently in God's word, in prayer, you will be ready and prepared for standing against the schemes of the devil. We must walk with God every day, be on guard to gain spiritual victory. Next, we need to know that we have the Holy Spirit. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit when he was tempted. The Holy Spirit does not keep us from temptation. But if you follow the Spirit's leading, you will not give in. The Holy Spirit of the Bible that we read about is the same Holy Spirit of today. As believers, each day we should allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit, walk in dependence on Him. Again, if Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit, how much more must we? How do we do this? Again, get into God's Word, spend time in prayer, meditate on Scripture, spend time worshiping God. We must be armed with Scripture. Each time the devil attacked Jesus, Jesus answered with Scripture. To use Scripture as Jesus did, we must commit it to memory. We will not always have a Bible with us when we are tempted, but God will bring to mind appropriate Scripture passages that we can use to battle our sinful nature as well as our enemy's attacks. We can apply Scripture to our daily lives, especially when we are tempted. This is why we must read the Bible regularly in our lives. And I recommend that if you struggle with a particular sin, say it be lust or gossip or whatever sin you struggle with, write down all the verses you can, you can find on it and commit them to memory. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, be ready. Jesus' victory over the devil is final. Ours continues while we are in this life. We need to be ready. We can put on the full armor of God that we read about in Ephesians chapter 6. We can stand firm in the face of temptation. We must not relax our guard until we are face to face with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has overcome the enemy. 
And if we depend on him, we can resist temptation. Sin and temptation are a reality that we all have to deal with. The question for you today is this, and for every day really, is this. How are you going to handle it? Will you give in and deal with its consequences? Or will you choose Jesus? Will you choose to say no to temptation? Yes to a life that honors God. Will you choose to follow Jesus? To use the principles that he teaches us to battle temptation with? It seems simple, but I know it is not. I battle temptations as all of you do each day. I have made mistakes at times. I have had to deal with the consequences. But I can say the more I am in God's word, the more I am in prayer, talking, and listening to God, battling those temptations becomes so much easier. I would encourage you next time you feel tempted, choose Jesus. Have the truth, the teachings of Jesus before you today. Don't follow the Red Baron's example in tossing that aside and ending beaten. Choose Jesus. Choose to be on the winning side of the war. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart You're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you, oh Thank you for joining, joining us again today as we close. I want to encourage you with this. I want to encourage you to go today choosing Jesus, choosing to follow him, knowing that temptation will come, but knowing from Christ's example that there is victory ahead. 
So dig into God's word. Spend time in prayer. Be prepared. Christ will be with you in times of struggle. And if you struggle, may the Spirit guide you back to Christ. In the end, the battle is won. Go in the peace of our Lord. Thank you.